Welcome back to Your Family Dog. My guest today is Molly Sumridge, who's a dog trainer, owner of Kindred Companions, and she's also a trained compassion fatigue educator. And I invited Molly to talk with me today about the subject of community, because I think that's such an important piece in helping us thrive. Thanks so much for coming on, Molly. Oh, my pleasure. I'm so happy to be here. I am so glad you asked me to come chat. Well, community obviously resonates with you very deeply because you've actually created a Facebook community of pet professionals. What inspired you to do that? I believe, I have to go back a little bit because the community has been around a little while, but I was always not just drawn to animals, but drawn to the community that animals creates, whether it's the dog sports community or whether it's the professional community. And I, I really noticed that, you know, a lot of us struggle you know, to talk about things, to talk about the human side of the work that we do. And on a spur of the moment, uh, I think somewhere around the time that, you know, our, our industry lost Dr. Sophia Yin, mm -hmm. it, it was it was obvious to me that we needed a safe space to talk. And so yeah. that's sort of what spurred that on. And um, yeah, now we're about 1,600 members strong and the community is... There for dog trainers, behavior professionals, veterinarians, pet sitters, groomers, people even simply in the retail industry, volunteers, anyone who feels their, you know, a kinship to the association of, of the professional work that we do, researchers, you name it, um, are all welcome. And we have really, really cool conversations and a really amazing supportive group. Yeah. And I think support is one of the big elements of community. I was, I was, thinking about community before our call and like what are the elements that make a group a community because that's not always the same thing and I think support is one of the key pieces that you need to feel acknowledged welcome seen respected valued and supported that someone is there and cares and can help you up when you're feeling down you're you're absolutely right I think that's something that we've strived for too in in just this you know online group is that we are engaged, that we talk to each other, that we care about each other, that we give advice without judgment. You know, we, we, we work very hard to police that too, just to make sure everybody does feel safe. You know, we're, we're kind in, in communications of when, oops, maybe somebody's feelings or ego came out a little bit too much. We, you know, we understand that's natural and normal, you know, but we, we work that out. And one of the things that I think is very important about our community is when we vent or we talk about a topic that is, you know, very stirring emotionally, I really try and encourage something I call a debrief, which is in a sense trying to work on what happened, but also find a constructive end to it right. versus just, you know, struggling and sort of treading water in whatever we're dealing with. Yeah. And I think, I think what you just brought up there is such an important part of a, of a good, healthy community is that we will have some conflict. We will have some moments where we don't always agree, but we need to find ways to talk about those things and find the common ground, but also learn to apologize and to forgive. And each part of that is a difficult life skill. <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, having a, a place where where it's acknowledged that these are our goals and we're working toward that um, really matters. So if, if someone's trying to create a community within their workplace, the, the team that they're working with, what are some of the things that you would encourage them to focus on? Uh, I, I love this question, um, actually, because yesterday I was uh, doing a program for a major animal shelter. And that's one of the things, you know, we were sort of talking about is how do we communicate with each other? Mm -hmm. and how do we do it respectfully and thoughtfully? And it is something that takes practice and mindfulness. It's, mm -hmm. it's when you receive information you don't agree with or you're not sure about or you're in conflict over, being mindful of that experience, taking the emotion out for a second, standing there and looking at it and saying, this makes me feel angry. This makes me feel upset. What aspects of it are causing that? And mm -hmm. how can we work, we, constructively together to find a solution? Because we're all in this together. And I'm a firm believer that regardless of your ideology, regardless of your methods, regardless of where, where you come at this, we all have the same interest, which is, you know, helping animals, having connections with animals. And for, you know, I think a decent percentage of us you know, bonding with the human element of it as well, the owners and, you know, and, and, and pieces like that. And so since if we can all meet on that community level, that we all are in this together for the same greater good, 
trying to remember that that at least is where we can connect and that nobody's doing this to cause harm. We just are trying different solutions. So if we can honor that and be respectful of that when we communicate, say, oh, you know, I understand that you probably have a great reason for this protocol, but I just don't understand it and I'm in, I'm in conflict with it. Can you help me better understand so maybe we can come to a common ground? We can avoid a lot of the conflict that we have in, in a lot of these communities. It's just very challenging to remove yourself from the emotions and come down to that place. Yes, so, yeah. it's very challenging to do yeah. that. But the awareness piece is, is really key mm-hmm. because the emotions are related to our our underlying beliefs and we're not always examining those. And so we sometimes add judgments and all sorts of backstory to things that aren't really true. And, and your premise that even people who are doing things very differently from you and in a way that you would never support their goal is probably not, I'm out to be awful to people and animals. Their Mm -hmm. goal is probably to use the tools that they believe are effective Mm -hmm. and serve we just don't necessarily agree with the methodology. Yes. And to to come at it from the belief of you're a horrible person and you're ruining the world doesn't actually sway anyone. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it creates more yes. distance. <laughs> yes. It just, it just makes deeper islands. And it is. I mean, I think we can boil it all down to we're all looking for solutions towards a successful coexistence. Yes. It's really just that simple. And that simplicity makes it, like I said, incredibly tricky about how we all go about it. Cause there's innumerable ways to approach that. And some of those things are grounded in our professional ideas, but also in our socio-cultural influences. And mm-hmm. it's not fair to say to somebody, well, just because you grew up in a country that treats animals different than mine, my belief system is better than yours. We can't, mm-hmm. can't do that. It's very easy to take a quantitative, you know, ethological behavior science perspective on this and ignore the qualitative social science aspects of sociocultural influences on how we navigate our world and how we communicate with each other. <laughs> so, I know that was a big jargony mouthful, wasn't Dad, it? <laughs> he's got some advanced degrees there. <laughs> I'm only a couple weeks shy of finishing my master's. And, and I think before we started this chat, I was, I was doing thesis work. So <laughs> I apologize if it comes out that way. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the, the reality is, that's true, that it all comes down to that kind of thing. And the awareness piece is interesting, but not enough. Yeah. So this week I was doing a session at a vet clinic and we were talking about active constructive responding, which is a lovely jargony phrase. I was going to say, there we go. I know, you and I, <laughs> we could be the behavior nerds. Um, <laughs> It's a way of sharing good news with someone else in a, in a positive way. And, and it comes into four quadrants. And so we were, we were demonstrating what good versus not so good is. And, and using the example of one of the people shared that he's super excited the Game of Thrones is coming back. And so like an active destructive response would be, well, you know, it's the last season and there's only seven episodes. And I mean, it's really sort of trivial anyway, just like suck the joy right out of his, his, (laughs) and then active constructive is of course, taking his joy and feeding on it. What do you love about that? What, what lights you up? And so we were practicing. There's also passive constructive and passive destructive. So like passive constructive is like, oh, that's nice. Eh. <laughs> you know, and <laughs> passive destructive is, oh, good for you. So um, I really like Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Have you watched that? You know, where it's like, take what's interesting to you and then veer off in my way. So <laughs> when we were working together, we're all practicing and we've t- teamed people up, share something awesome and, a- and ask questions. So I'm the teacher, I'm the facilitator, I'm doing this. And I'm paired up with one of the participants and she shares with me that she just got two snakes. And the first words out of my mouth are, I've never had a snake. And then I ask good questions, but that awareness piece wasn't enough. So she was not sharing. I just got two snakes and I'm really dying of curiosity to know if Colleen has ever had a snake. No, (laughs) that was not her main motivation in sharing this news. And so that was with the best of intentions. I showed up 
interested and eager to engage with her on a positive level. And even knowing that, I still just like veered off, you know? Yeah. So these awareness pieces of how do we build community and how do we support one another and how do we add to the positive good, we need to we need to have that awareness first that that there are distinctions and that these things matter, but also have safe places to practice them and to you're, be able to have the do over. Like whoop, that's you're up. so right. <laughs> you're so right. And amen to the word practice. Because mm-hmm. I think that's something no one ever thinks about is actually pro- practicing how we communicate with each other it's something that we're never taught. We're not taught Mm -hmm. even how to communicate in school. And, you know, again, we talk about their sociocultural influences on how we talk, but certainly in in these professional fields, I think one of the challenges we have is, especially in an unregulated field like training and behavior, we feel like we want to ground ourselves in some sort of um, um, reassurance that we are valued and that Mm -hmm. our information is correct. And in, I think that's sort of where we get the, oh, somebody's talking about something that I think I, I understand. Let me insert myself into this to, re, to, to make sure that I, I am valid, that I matter, right. that, that I count. And it's really easy to do because we think we're empathizing, but we empathize with an insertion of ourselves instead of, you know, saying I, like you just said with the snake example, I've never had a snake. Yeah. And it's interesting because you're absolutely right it does, it requires some self check to even just remember to ask questions. Mm -hmm. It's so hard for us when we want to connect socially to another person, when we're not just interviewing a client to want to just say, Hey, this is me. Do we connect? Well, Oh, Hey, that's you. Maybe we do connect well, but we don't want, you know, I don't know. know, I'm going to self check myself and say, I don't think it's want, but we're not practiced at, asking more questions and opening, making the other piece of person feel safe to share mm-hmm. in a connected, compassionate way versus just, you know, running off your sort of intellectual resume that's running through our brains at any given moment. Yeah. I think it's really interesting because a lot of these behaviors come from a good place yeah. and yet they, and they, they sound that. So when we were talking in, in this event we were talking about the negative, a lot of the people who are just full of the negatives are trying to keep you safe, you know, so mm-hmm. that when you say, I have this great idea, I'm going to open my own business. And, and your parents say, oh, that's really risky. You know, how will you get insurance? How will you know if you have enough money? What if, where will you live? They're not trying to puncture your balloon. They're trying to keep you safe. But over time, that kind of thing just makes you go, I'm not going to talk to these people. I'm not going to share my stuff. <laughs> oh, my God. Yes. There was a TED Talk I listened to a few months ago. It blew my mind. And I will have to look up the name of it and, you know, send it to you so we can put it in the show notes. But it was a poet talking about all the things she learned from writing. And one of them was that caring is a form of control. Mm -hmm. And that blew my mind mind because you know i i work personally so hard to be a caring person and i think that so many people in our community do but is that exerting a form of control and that's sort of what you just said resonated for me with that of yes being negative is not necessarily trying to harm the other person's hopes and dreams it's to warn them it's to stave off mm-hmm. you know you you care enough that you don't want to see their a possibility of harm but instead we're inadvertently harming that right. passion that right. exists there and, and that growth that's trying to occur. You know, it's hard for us to remember that pain is part of life and pain yeah. is part of growth and bringing, you know, sort of back to the community. I'm the type of person, and I'm still trying to learn how to navigate this, how to allow an individual to exist in their pain while letting them know I am there for them but acknowledging the fact that their pain is theirs and that I should not try to minimize it or solve it because that's taking something away from them. So mm-hmm. there's, there's so many levels. <laughs> I know. It's tough. It's tough. That whole concept of like unconditional positive regard that, mm-hmm. that uh, you have within you all that you need and all that you have you need. So mm-hmm. when you're kind of struggling with this like issue, you – you're going to make it through and we can support you and help you and be there for you. But you have to kind of honor the person's journey and and let them make their decisions and, and honestly experience the negative stuff Mm -hmm. without 
so, so often when someone's in pain, we, we just want to give the advice mm-hmm. because we're feeling the pain. So mm-hmm. the advice makes us feel better. Like, okay, look, I contributed. <laughs> It doesn't actually help the other person at all because our advice was not tailored to their situation very well, but Mm -hmm. we feel that sense of relief. And that's from the the desire for community, the Mm -hmm. desire to care and support and to contribute. Mm -hmm. But whether or not that's effective is entirely defined by the recipient. And that's, that's all, I think that's a lifelong learning thing. I mean, when we look at all of the people who we think are awesome at that, They've evolved over their lives and they're building that. So I think it's fair that none of us are perfect at it. Mm -hmm. But if we don't even know that's a goal, then it's going to be a lot harder to get there. (laughs) So having a sense of that. It's true. And I think we can use our community as sort of, again, being mindful of how our experiences are with different individuals and saying, ooh, like, I don't like how that person said that to me. And instead of making it about them, say, what was it about how they communicated that hurt? Not that they were trying to be hurtful. And then being mindful of, I should try not to communicate that way because I probably have. <laughs> I mean, mm-hmm. we do. It's funny, one of my personal favorite communicators in our, in our community is Dr. Susan Friedman. I can listen to her for hours just analyzing how she speaks. Mm-hmm. How she's so mindful about how she communicates. How she's mindful about judging other individuals' actions. And she's just so magical and amazing that way uh, of just how mindful is. And that's not even what she's trying to teach in that moment. You know, she's right. trying to do something else, but her, her form of expression mm-hmm. is so amazing. And to think the journey I'm sure she was on to develop that was probably very powerful. Yes, I imagine so. Yeah. So from the, from the perspective of community where people come together to support one another, to share ideas, to, you know, share resources, to find ways to contribute. What do you think are, are the elements that we're struggling to find on a personal level? Why are, why is it such a challenge? Ooh, that's deep. Um, (laughs) Again, just multi-layered. I don't even know if I have all the answers to that. I think I think because we all come to this community from a different, for a different reason. Every time I talk to somebody else in this community, you know, you'll hear the same surface reasons why we're here and why we're trying to grow and how we all struggle. And it's usually like, there's the simple ones, like people are struggling and frustrated with compliance or clients or uh, the state of just having your eyes open to animals and how they struggle and their welfare but then that deeper level of where we exist and how we are participants and how we navigate that and then again that deeper level of I'm struggling but am I mindful enough to know why exactly I'm struggling so there's just so so many tears to it and I think everyone is in a different place in developing where their awareness is and I think that's what's so beautiful about our community is because we're all in a different place we all at least bring a little different nugget of, of that. I know when I communicate with the community, my, my passions exist in things like building healthy habits and boundaries and mindfulness of, of my own personal actions. And so I bring those little tidbits where somebody else might bring a better way of articulating a form of communication or something like that. Cause that's sort of how they've grown in the direction they've gone in. So it's super duper interesting how it all comes together. Not sure yeah. if I answered your question, but it went somewhere good. It did. It went somewhere. It did. So so when someone shows up to you and and they're in struggle, where do you suggest they start? Whew. That's a that's a tough one, only because it that reminds me of somebody being like, somebody comes to you and they say they're having problems with their dog. Where do I start? <laughs> and again, I think it runs in a similar line, which is I go towards observation. What are you seeing? And I think I, I sort of ask, ask the humans that, you know, to themselves, what are you seeing? What are you experiencing? Not like, you know, oh, I'm frustrated with owner compliance, but it could be, or, oh my gosh, you know, I, I cannot answer my emails. If those were some of the things I stated. Okay, well, tell me more about your day. How does that fit into your day? What, what is your routine? Like, what does your world look like? 
so that I can try and see as many contributing factors as possible that maybe just don't normally come to mind. And I I certainly don't think I catch them all. So I I try and make a concerted effort to then bring them up and say, well, is is this something? Mm -hmm. Is this something? Because I can certainly make up things that I think I see, but not being, you know, in their shoes, in their vessel, as it were. I, I don't know for sure, but I think that's how I start. Yeah, I do too. The whole a whole lot of curiosity and interesting exploration into what people say and 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 the judgments that they apply to it. Because mm-hmm. as dog trainers, we're well aware that what our what our owners tell us about their dog's behavior is not the same as what a person describing a videotape of the occurrence would describe. Mm-hmm. You know, so there's all sorts of backstory and motivation that wasn't actually the behavior. And often that happens too when when people are struggling that there are the underlying beliefs that will come out in the conversation and can perhaps be explored. Absolutely. So if a person is feeling sort of lonely and alienated, what kind of steps do you think they could take to foster a sense of community with people around them? I think there's a few different approaches for that, depending on how comfortable somebody is engaging. I use myself as an example, and I think why I try and be sensitive to this is I was very much a quote-unquote type B personality person for most of my adolescence. I was very shy. I didn't reach out to people, and that would have been the most terrifying thing in the world. That would have been more aversive to just being lonely. But flip that to now I've somehow changed myself into a type A person (laughs) where I can walk up to any stranger in the room and that's very reinforcing for me. So finding a baseline where what what forms of communication are safe and also trying to better understand if that person feels, it's going to probably come out weird, but feel that it is more needed for somebody else to reach out to them than for them to reach out and engage. Because I do think that there are people out there that feel that because they're not invited into the conversation, they're not reached out to, they feel isolated versus Mm -hmm. people who are engaged who feel isolated. So I think those are are different things. So sort of finding that out, but then I guess in asking for specific advice, it kind of runs the gamut from if there's somebody in the community, I will, I will actually sometimes bring up prompts and topics that they Mm -hmm. are willing to participate in, but are not willing to initially engage. So maybe they're not willing to make a post, but they're struggling with something. Okay, I'm happy to make a prompt and encourage you to engage. And now you have all these people to talk to, sort of like making our own little group party to, Mm -hmm. to sort of mingle with. But you know, if that's not really their thing, it can be things like reaching outside of your comfort zone and your interests. I cannot remember the quote exactly, but one of my favorite quotes is find something where you are the find something you are the worst at and participate in that. <laughs> um, and there's something to that because I, I started taking a martial arts class where I'm definitely the worst. And it is almost a relief to stop being the expert in the room mm-hmm. and to just be the learner and just laugh at yourself and engage with other people on that learning level. So going out and just going and doing something that you have no idea what you're doing so it can be a great way of connecting with people and creating community yeah. and taking that burden of our expertise off of our shoulders, which so yeah. I think inhibits to a certain degree our, our community. I think you're right. And I think that the whole perfectionism piece plays a big role uh, for so many pet professionals where we have this idea of what perfect looks like and perpetually not reaching it. So that drives in. And so it can be very freeing to explore something new where you go in knowing not only are you terrible, but probably you're going to stay terrible, slightly Mm -hmm. better, but never, ever going to be awesome at this. So you're in it just for the joy of the experience. And I think what you just brought back into the perfectionism is helpful because it reminds you that it's okay not Mm -hmm. to be perfect, that you are existing in a perpetual, not perfect. You're existing in a periodic failure and that you're okay. You're alive. Nobody hates you. You're going to get up tomorrow. Nothing bad's going to happen. Nobody's suffering. And I think that's an important reminder that, you know, we want perfect for animals because we think animals deserve it. But, you know, going back to experiencing pain and experiencing life, we can't provide perfect. It's not realistic. So 
And I don't know when we're ever going to figure out what good enough is. I mean, we know that from discussions of welfare that can go on forever, but Mm -hmm. striving for some personal version of good enough. And, and I think that takes, again, talking about practice that takes practice. And some intentionality for it was when um, Dr. Chris Puckle was on, he did an episode on celebration. And one of, one of the things he said to me was that he has defined a successful visit with a client as one in which the client understood everything that he was um, suggesting and that he understood all of their concerns and needs. So full picture on both sides. Ta-da, that's success. He said, right. so that it's not like everything magically was resolved. We fixed all the problems. Everything's awesome. They implementing perfectly. No, <laughs> yeah. if, if that's his level of success, he's never, ever, ever going to reach it. But if he can say like, we really communicated well, we, I know they understood what I shared with them and I know that they felt heard and that I understood. And I laughed because I said, I have definitions of success for so many things, but I hadn't ever broken it down to like, what is a successful appointment? And when we don't do that, we're still always holding that perfect out there as the thing that we're not reaching and our brains are wired for the negativity. So we're always seeing that part that wasn't perfect. Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting um, concept of, of what does good enough look like. And we're not going to be able to lean into good enough unless we define good enough. Yeah. What's, What's good enough? Yeah. That is, I think the million dollar question in why I think you're right, that feeds the perfectionism, that feeds um, the negativity and the depression and the hopelessness. And Mm -hmm. yeah, I think, I mean, it's brilliant because I I did listen to that and I think think Dr. Pockles is just just so incredible. And it's it's such an important reminder that it is, it's what is good enough? What, what is our, you know, what's a baseline good place for the work we do? But I think we can apply that again, going back to community is what, how do I want to communicate with my colleagues? How do I want to communicate with my industry? Mm -hmm. Where do I want to exist in it? And sort of figuring that out, you know, (laughs) it's going to sound so dorky. I was watching a, my favorite TV show is the magicians. And one of the, the, the sort of episodic points that they were trying to make is that when we are inserted into something deep enough, it no longer is how we pictured it from the outside. Mm -hmm. And I think for ourselves, how we want to be in our industry, uh, how we want our industry to be is going to be very different when we say, I want to be a, or I am a, right. And and coming to terms with that, there's a, there's a time to grieve the fact that they're Mm -hmm. never going to be the same thing. And the same with the relationships that we have with individuals, you know, we, we, some of these people in our community are our heroes, and then we get to know them and we realize they're human. And there's going to be aspects that again, we have to come to terms with and grieve those perfections that are now human. And the same with, you know, our smaller communities, as we get to know other professionals in our area, we're going to say, oh, so and so is awesome with puppies, but oh my God, her advice for aggression cases is terrible. And coming to terms with, but they're human and they're trying mm-hmm. to find goals and outcomes. And how am I going to navigate that? So not just what is a good enough consultation, what is a good enough session with a client, but what is a good enough relationship with my field and my colleagues and my friends and my supportive other you know professions? And I don't think we ever think about that, but I think it's needed. No. no. And I think that, I think that is amazing and really powerful way to think about it. And I think that the community itself provides the entry toward that because it helps people normalize their feelings of frustration or not enoughness um, when when they say, I'm struggling with this or that. Mm-hmm. And then other people say, me too. So So the first step being oh, it's not just that I am doing a poor job at this. It's that real life is messy and complicated. But then the bigger piece of real life is messy and complicated and people can do awesome, amazing things while still being fallible and human mm-hmm. and never, ever, ever being perfect. Yeah. Community. Yeah. that That's literally, <laughs> I think, why it's so important and why it's so necessary. You know, I 
I have to remind myself sometimes and self check because, you know, I created this community and a lot of people put me on a pedestal that I, you know, here's some imposter syndrome for you. I don't think I deserve at all. <laughs> and, you know, I, I posted the other day that I had been struggling the last few weeks and I realized I made the post not because I, I, I needed to receive a certain type of support. I did it for a couple of reasons. One, I needed to verbalize to the universe, admit that I was struggling because it's very easy when, you know, you try and maintain a community like this, that you have to somehow be the pinnacle perfection of keeping your stuff together. I'll try and keep this PG. Um, (laughs) And at the same time, so yes, so admitting to my community that yes, I struggle, that I'm not perfect. Mm -hmm. And also trying to walk the walk, talk the talk that I, that I claim and also be constructive. Say I am struggling, but I am aware of how I'm struggling. I am aware of what isn't working right. And here, scroll down a few comments, you can see where I am applying the skills necessary to try and get out of this rut. I'm one of those goofballs that puts hashtags in there. And one of the ones I put was perfect, not perfect. And, you know, that it is perfectly fine to not be perfect. And that's normal. That is that is yeah. the ideal because who am I to, to try and gather a community and then say, well, you have to, to live this way. And it was nice. I actually got a couple of, you know, I got plenty of messages of people reaching out being like, Hey, you okay? Which is wonderful. But I did get a few people that reached out and said, you know, thank you for reminding me that we all struggle regardless of what pedestals, you know, we put people on that, that mm-hmm. underneath the skin is still a brain and, dopamine and serotonin and you know we have good days and bad days and and all that good stuff yeah i i think that's the key i think really that community provides that where it it helps to you know everyone is a member and there's a a sense of equality and support and respect Mm -hmm. and trust and and inspiration but also you know resources and and support Mm -hmm. all of those pieces coming together so that we can hold each other up as we all struggle mightily. And it makes us better. Four or five years ago, I joke that, you know, each, when we all enter the field, we sort of have our own cohort. We have our own group of professionals that's sort of starting around the same time we are, and we sort of grow up together. And you remember those people, you know, oh, who took your certification test at the same time? And who was, you know, and I noticed some of the professionals I was talking to had sort of plateaued. Oh, they weren't comfortable really taking clients. And I would say to them, why? Oh, well, I'm not good enough yet. I'm not experienced enough yet. And one of the things I would say to them is, well, what's good enough? Like, you know, Mm -hmm. so what we were talking about is, you know, what is a good enough appointment? And they'd want more education and more education and more education and more education. And what I'm starting to think, and, and this conversation has sort of helped with that is, It's not necessarily, definitely more education is great, but more community, more community Mm -hmm. to find out how are we actually, you know, you know, tear the curtain away. How are we actually navigating our worlds? You know, what, and how do we do it in a healthy way? Because it's so easy to be unhealthy in our field, as you know, and uh, call out negative martyr based practices, call out the, the hustle culture of, of putting in, you know, 16 hours a day, you know, and saying, no, you're allowed to do this and you're allowed to be healthy about it and you're allowed to make mistakes. And guess what? There's, you know, a thousand plus the rest of us that are doing it all the same way, you know, with plenty of mistakes and, and, and plenty of rough spots, but we're still getting the job done. Mm-hmm. Well, that's awesome. I think that's a lovely summary of of community. So let's wrap there. If people wanted to learn more about you and your work, how could they do that? So I have too many websites, but <laughs> <laughs> you can, you, uh, anyone listening can find me. My training website is kindredcompanions.com. That's where I, I do my local training, I guess. And I also run an online community for primitive dog owners called couchwolves.com. And finally, my professional, you know, site where I do Passion fatigue and, and the, the coaching and all that is mollysummeridge.com. Oh, awesome. Thanks so much for joining me today, Molly. This has been really fun. My pleasure. Oh, and can I plug the online community we were talking about? Absolutely. So it's Facebook based. So I'm sorry if, you know, to those of you listening who are not Facebook users, I, I totally get that. But our community 
is uh, the Humanity of Pet Professionals. So if you look that up, you will find us and we are more than happy for you to, to join our community. Awesome. All those links will be in the show notes. Perfect. Well, thanks so much. Do you want to feel stronger, happier, and more resilient? Let's face it, who doesn't? Check out the new Unleashed Resilience Skills Groups. They're online, small group sessions that are guaranteed to improve your outlook on life. Visit ColleenPilar.com for more info.